yourself or no? no. I don't know. You, you don't want yeah. to be But if you would keep yourself muted during our speakers, we would appreciate it. I don't know. How many screens are on? Uh, hold on a second. We're just waiting for the signal from um, Congressman Deutsch to begin. Why is someone sharing their screen? Right. Marty Pines. Alana, you need to turn that off. Okay, that's better. I just manually stopped it. Yeah. Alana, go into security, go into the security settings and don't allow share, share screen sharings. For host those those the speakers could be co-hosts and that would obviate that. So Wendy has left a message for everybody for tonight's um, event with Congressman Deutsch. And you can save uh, all the messages in the chat by going to the very bottom to the right and you see the three dots, the ellipses, and it will allow you to save chat at the end. Thank you all for coming and glad uh, to see everybody's faces. We're just waiting to get the okay to begin from Congressman Deutsch. And while we're waiting, I'll remind everyone that on Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, October 20th, we're having a vaccination discussion. I had incorrectly sent out information last week the starting time is 7.30 for this program. So I just wanted to reiterate that the starting time is While we're waiting for the Congressman to log on, do you want to start with the introductions, Alana? We've already done some. Um, okay. No, we're just waiting for oh, wait. um, Here he, Here he is. Ah, I see Representative Deutsch. <laughs> okay. Good afternoon, everybody. First, I would like to convey a message from Rabbi Kiefer sent to me this morning. He wanted to share his regrets to the listeners 
and to Congressman Deutsch that he couldn't be with us today due to the death of his brother and that he was still sitting shiver. So our thoughts and prayers are with the rabbi and his family. Congressman Ted Deutsch first entered Congress in 2010. His district currently includes much of North Broward and a Southern part of Palm Beach County. Congressman Deutsch currently serves on the Committee on Foreign Affairs, the Judiciary and Ethics. Congressman Deutsch has led efforts to fight for the justice and dignity of Holocaust survivors and combat anti-Semitism at home and abroad throughout his tenure in Congress. Recently, he was appointed to the steering committee for the Interparliamentary Coalition for Combating Anti-Semitism, an organization of legislators from all over the world who share a commitment to ending anti-Semitism. It is our honor and pleasure to welcome Congressman Ted Deutsch. Well, thanks very much. Uh, nice to nice to be with you. Uh, please, um, I'm so I was sorry to hear that news. Please send my condolences to the rabbi. Uh, and I'm also going to hold on. I think you might hear me better. Hold on one second. No, I, mean, I believe in our in our in our you know law enforcement, and you know I, I think you're coming back <laughs> now now <laughs> all right sorry this um apparently a lot of people have been using this thing called zoom for a while this is the first time i've tried it just <laughs> kidding <laughs> uh, sorry about that uh well it is really great to be with you and um uh, uh judy how, how long tell me how how long we have Oh, I was told by your um, office, we have 30 minutes all together. Okay, all right, so I will speak for a bit and then I'm happy to take questions. How's that? Wonderful. Um, all right, so I, um, and I'll start with, with where you left off. I, obviously there's a, whole, there's a whole lot going on in, in Washington. We're in the middle of a big election campaign, um, but some of the things that are happening aren't, uh, aren't getting as much attention um, and I, I think I'll focus on those. It, I'm happy to talk during the Q&A about the COVID relief efforts and where the legislation is and what more I think needs to be done. I'm happy to talk uh, at length about all of the ways that uh, I, I think we can be doing more to help us move through this uh, better and faster. But uh, I'll actually start by talking again, given given the group that I'm privileged to spend time with, uh, I'll start with, with uh, what you just mentioned in the introduction, which is this new group that we just started. One of the things that, uh, well, there are a lot of things that, that we've learned as a result of this pandemic. And obviously we've never experienced anything like this before. Um, and, and for all of the ways that we're going to change and that we have changed as a result of this, the one thing that sadly hasn't changed is the increase in anti-Semitism that we saw over the past few years um, hasn't abated during the pandemic. In fact, we've seen, uh, we've seen a shift, especially during the lockdown. We, we saw that as, just as people were, uh, were being forced to stay inside, they took uh, more often and too often, uh, they took their, their hatred online. And as a result, 
we've seen, we've read about, some of us have experienced the, the Zoom bombing, the people who barged into the Zoom calls and, um, and used that to, to spew all kinds of anti-Semitic and, and racist rants. Um, but for those of us who have watched this increase in anti-Semitism at home and around the world, and, and to know that some, for someone like me, a member of Congress who several years ago started the first bipartisan task force in Congress to combat anti-Semitism, something that we started because of the anti-Semitism in France and, and Belgium and England, uh, we never could have imagined that just a few years later, we would see the deadliest attack on the American Jewish community in history in Pittsburgh, and then the follow up attack in Poway. And, um, and we've seen this steady rise in anti-Semitism. And then the pandemic happened and so much of it moved online uh, that we, we got together, uh, I got together with uh, a member of the Knesset, uh, Michal Kotler Wunsch, uh, and several other members of the Knesset, uh, some of my colleagues from the House, um, uh, Chris Smith and Deborah Rossman Schultz and Mario Diaz Ballart, and parliamentarians also from, from the UK and from Australia. Uh, the idea was that as this anti Semitism increased around the world, we needed to, to not allow the social media companies to treat this as individual cases so that their response in the United States might be one thing, but their response in Israel might be something else. And in Europe, they might have a completely different approach. This is something that affects everyone all around the world. Um, it's particularly something that we need to, to worry about as members of the Jewish community. So we launched this, this interparliamentary coalition to combat online anti-Semitism. Uh, we, we generate a lot of attention with the launch. Uh, we have another meeting this week. Our hope is to be able to bring together uh, in, a, in this sort of format. So not in person, since none of this is happening in person these days, but we want to be able to bring together uh, people who care about this issue from around the world and have the opportunity to speak to executives from Twitter and TikTok and Facebook and Google about the way that they approach these issues. Facebook you may have seen just this past week, finally, finally, two years after Mark Zuckerberg said it was okay for people to post things, post Holocaust denial, because it wasn't really up to him to decide what's true and what isn't. Facebook finally announced that they're, they're no longer going to allow Holocaust denial, uh, which was a big step forward. We want to really ramp that up and, and be able to, to question these companies and make sure they're doing everything they can to keep the anti-Semites off of their platforms and to not, not be used by people who want to use these companies to help spread hate. Uh, so that's the direction that we're headed. And then on top of that, uh, I've been having conversations as a senior member of the Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, I've been having conversations with, uh, with other members of parliament and ambassadors from around the world. And I think over the next couple of months, we'll also be able to announce participants in our coalition from the Bundestag in Germany, uh, from parliaments all throughout Europe. Uh, I think there will be some parliamentarians from Latin America uh, who are committed to combating anti-Semitism. And suddenly there will be this worldwide effort that, uh, that frankly will be too difficult for these companies to ignore. So I'm, I'm glad to share with you the launch of this effort, I think it's going to pay off. I think uh, it's, it's critically important because what we all, I think what we're all concerned with is that, uh, that what, and as we've seen this happen already, what starts online in the virtual world transitions often to the real world. And that results in, in violence and physical attacks. And, um, and so over the, the coming weeks and months, I think they'll There'll be, we'll see some, some significant steps forward there. I wanted to share that with all of you. And then I also, again, um, I'll talk about one more thing and then I will be glad to answer questions about everything that's on your mind. But uh, I also just wanted to, to spend a moment as the chairman of the Middle East subcommittee uh, where I work, um, I, I spend many hours working to 
strengthen the U.S.-Israel relationship, work toward peace and a two-state solution, work toward, toward um, Okay. Is it our Zoom or is it his? It must be his because it's his. I just texted him. He's going to have to blog back Thank in. You. Thank you. Judy, how are we going to do questioning? Alana is going to recognize people who raise their hands. Okay. Okay. Sorry, this is happening, but you guys, I'm sure, understand. It must be your fault. You can yeah, what can I say? <laughs> God bless technology. <laughs> you have to have adequate bandwidth, increase your speeds. It's so odd, he never has this problem. I don't know why, I mean, he must have done a hundred Zooms. I have no idea why this is happening. I'm trying to figure, he's trying to figure it out right now. Thank you. So, so sorry. Well, at it's least okay. we can't blame him for being on the IT technology subcommittee, right? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but it's interesting to hear about this interparliamentary coalition. So while we're waiting, if you have any questions, you know, you can... Um, Think about those so that he can start taking questions immediately. So, so that other people are still coming. There he Alana is. needs to unmute. She's trying to Here talk. You. He's coming on now. Yeah. Hello. I um I can't figure this out. Can you hear me? We hear yes. you now, yes. I, all right. I I um uh, first first it was my computer, then it was the power. Now I'm on my phone. I hope this works. I'll quickly finish what I started and then I'll answer questions. Um, I was just talking about the, uh, uh, the agreement that was reached uh, between the Israelis, between Israel's government and the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain. Uh, and I was just, I started to, to talk about how significant it is uh, in the region when countries who weren't at, technically at war with Israel, but clearly did not have diplomatic relations, we're able to acknowledge what a lot of us have known for a long time, that, that the things that they share, the shared threat of Iran, the shared commitment to uh, strengthening their economies uh, and enhancing the opportunities for people in the region were greater than, uh, than the challenges that kept them apart. To come together like this is a really big deal. I think there will be more to come. Uh, I'm happy to answer lots of questions about that too, but um, since I'm, I'm afraid of what may happen next to my technology. Uh, I'm going to just stop and answer questions. How about that? <laughs> okay. Alana, are you there? Mark, Mark Greenlow is going to ask the first question. Hi, Representative Deutsch. Um, there's a lot of factors, obviously, that including some of the administrations allowing for this tribalism to get worse, and we're a tribe. But to what extent worldwide do you think the migration of many of the uh, Arab anti-Zionists into England and other countries, you know, escaping their regimes um, is adding to the anti-Semitism in, in those countries? Uh, it's a really, uh, that's a really important question. There are, uh, there are real challenges both I just and for those of us fighting anti-Semitism from uh, from the far left, from the far right, uh, and from 
um, and from um, um, radical Islam. And so in the case of the far right, obviously, you see this rise of white nationalism, uh, frankly, in our own country, but also in Europe. Uh, you saw the things that were said by the shooter in Pittsburgh and, um, and the shooter in, uh, in um, uh, the person who, who waged the attack in New Zealand. Uh, there's, so there's that threat. Uh, there's the threat uh, from the far left, not as violent, but, um, but the threat of BDS and, and the efforts to demonize Israel. And then there's, yeah, there's the threat in, in certain countries in Europe um, that's arisen with uh, an increase of, um, of, of people coming, it's just the, the vast migration all throughout Europe, especially coming from, um, from Syria and as a result of, of Assad's war on the people. Uh, and Macron obviously has been, in France has been talking a lot about this uh, and, and the groups, there are lots of groups in the community who are working with the Muslim community uh, to, to identify those who have this warped view of religion and to, to identify them uh, and uh, intervene before there's violence. So it's this, it's this really dangerous combination of all three. And I think Eric is actually speaking um, after me and we'll have lots of thoughts on that as well, but we need to worry about all of them. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, our next question will come from Ken and then Ann. Got to unmute myself. I do it for once. I'm not. I'm not hosting something. I've got to do things for real. And then our uh, Congressman Joe Deutsch. This is actually close to my wife. She says, "How can it be that Mitch McConnell says he'll call for votes on coronavirus relief bills Monday and Tuesday when the House is supposed to initiate all spending initiatives, and that the fact that your your caucus, your House, passed a three billion dollar uh, relief bill back on the 16th of May? It's been sitting." In the, in the graveyard for the last four months, five months almost. Um, well, thank you for, or thanks to your wife for that question. Listen, uh, the House, uh, we, we knew um, that the CARES Act that we passed in March that provided additional unemployment, unemployment for independent contractors, help for small businesses, and, and um, uh, so many help for local government. We knew that, that that was going to help get us through uh, the moment, but that when it expired at the end of July, um, it was more likely than not that we weren't going to be over the pandemic and that we would need to do more. So we passed the CARES Act over five months ago, as you pointed out, and uh, we got nothing, si silence from uh, our friends in the Senate, uh, including our own two senators here in Florida. And, and then that was, that was in March. Then they said that when they finally started talking about it after Mitch McConnell got done arguing that states and local government should just go bankrupt, which is uh, a, 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 frankly a dangerous position to hold, uh, they said our, our bill was too expensive. So a few weeks ago, we went back to Washington and instead of, uh, instead of making the bill uh, over $3 trillion, we reduced it in duration because we thought we'll just deal with the crisis at hand instead of extending it out longer. Um, reduced it by over $1.2 trillion and still we got nothing in return. And then when the president got back to the White House after he had COVID, when he returned from the hospital, the first thing he did was to say that he didn't wanna do a deal at all. Then he came back and said he wanted to do a big deal. Ultimately, I'll just sum it up like this. Where we are at this moment is the president, if, he were, if he's committed to, to providing relief, the president ought to call the speaker and the Senate majority leader into the White House, and they ought to stay there until they get this done. And if he doesn't do that, Mitch McConnell is going to wind up doing something that provides this blanket immunity uh, that provides benefits to larger corporations without providing the necessary help to uh, to small businesses and to childcare workers and schools, and we're not gonna be in a position to move forward. So I, I mean, I've been saying this for weeks. I think the president, since he got out of the hospital, since he tested negative for COVID, uh, he ought to get everybody in to get this done. That's, that's, the, that's what leadership is called for now. And 
uh, unfortunately, I just don't, I don't have faith. I don't think there's any reason for us to believe that's what will happen. Thank you. So Ann Berman will go next and then Arlene Corsover. Good afternoon, Congressman. Thank you for coming. And My thank pleasure. you for this uh, intergovernmental uh, program. Uh, I hope it works. But since we're talking about anti-Semitism, um, why did our House of Representatives miss an, op an opportunity a couple of years ago to issue a resolution condemning anti-Semitism and instead of the democratically controlled House of Representatives, I might add, uh, instead of this watered down, uh, the watered down version where anti-Semitism was barely mentioned. I mean, I think if the American government wants to have influence around the world with all these other governments, we need to show that we're taking it seriously and we issued our own declaration against it. Why did uh, right, happen? so I will, look, it, I will, I'll, I'll answer this two ways. One, um, the language wasn't watered down. It, the language was actually pretty tough, but as the person who literally spent the better part of four days writing the resolution that condemned anti-Semitism after one of my colleagues invoked uh, some of the worst anti-Semitic, classically anti-Semitic tropes and lies, um, I, I went to the house floor and in one of, uh, in a moment that I, I certain, one of the low points, a point I didn't think I'd ever have to reach, I had to go to the house floor and lecture my colleagues on why it shouldn't be so hard for us to singularly condemn anti-Semitism. So I don't disagree with you on that at that moment. I thought it should have been a resolution that, that condemned anti-Semitism alone. I think we, we missed that opportunity. That said, and so I, I'm not gonna write that off and it was significant. Um, I would then, however, fast forward to the, uh, the next year, so that was, that was in 2019, um, and actually not even the next year, I would fast forward to the next summer, summer of 2019, when the House, as you point out, the democratically controlled House, passed, uh, passed a resolution condemning the anti-Semitic BDS movement. Uh, we did that with almost 400 votes. And um, though not related to anti-Semitism, still important, passed another resolution supporting uh, the United States ironclad commitment to Israel security and passed uh, legislation that I introduced that expands the cooperation between the United States and Israel and takes the uh, 38, uh, $38 billion aid package to Israel and puts it into statute for the first time. That we passed unanimously. So uh, we, we managed to move a long way from that moment in March of 2019, but uh, I've tried to use that as a moment to continue to point out to my colleagues why it's so important for us to condemn anti-Semitism because it doesn't just affect Jews. If there is anti-Semitism in your country, and we've seen this in America up, up close, uh, those white supremacists who hate Jews, uh, they also... Uh, they're also racist and uh, and they're often misogynistic. And so we need to combat anti-Semitism where we see it. And the last thing I'll say, sorry for the long answer. Last thing I'll say about this is it, it also reminds us why we need to do a better job uh, making sure people understand the lessons of the Holocaust. I was in, I went with Speaker Pelosi and, and some of my colleagues in a bipartisan delegation to Auschwitz and then on to Israel uh, to mark the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. And we came back to Washington and we passed the Never Again Education Act to make sure that schools uh, have the resources they need to teach Holocaust education. If we're not doing that, then it's one more place where the anti-Semites uh, have an opening to try to, uh, to try to confuse people and spread their pernicious lies. We have to do all of that. So I, um, I continue to push uh, all of my colleagues to, to emphasize these issues. So now we have Arlene, then we have TR, Andy, and the Whitrocks. Hi, Senator Joyce, it's, uh, Congressman Joyce, it's good to see you. Thank you for coming. My um, pleasure. 
um, my question is kind of revolves around Anne's as well. Um, I appreciate all that you do um, as a congressman and, and as a Jew within Congress when um, uh, anti-Semitism comes up. But, and I say this, but nothing angers me more, and I, I get angry just thinking about it, when what is now known as the squad uh, comes up with some absolutely outrageous, inaccurate, wrong, and should not even be allowed within the walls of the house to speak. And your counterparts, including Schumer, they especially the Jews, just sit there. Nobody gets up and says, excuse me, this is wrong. It, it, it shouldn't even be addressed here. It, it, and in my mind, <coughs> it allows anti-Semitism to be accepted. If it's accepted in language in the house, why not those anti-Semites who remain quiet before seems, well, okay, then we can say our piece. Um, okay. Then First, first of all, for th thanks for the question. Uh, first of all, uh, there is no one uh, who accepts the language of anti-Semitism. And as I said about that moment in March of 2019, it's not that it's not that anti-Semitism wasn't condemned because it was. It's that it should have been condemned singularly. But there is no one who defends anti-Semitic language, and. I will say, and this is, I, this is not a political statement. This is how I feel deeply. When you say there is nothing that upsets you more than when you hear some freshman members of Congress who, whose views are outside of the mainstream of the Democratic caucus, a Democratic caucus, which as I pointed out before, has a very strong record of, of fighting BDS and supporting the state of Israel, um, and that and that those views again, which are not in the mainstream, uh, are so upsetting to you. I would tell you quite honestly that what upsets me more than anything else is when the president of the United States um, in on national television can't unequivocally and simply and straightforward and without hemming and hawing condemn white supremacists like the ones uh, who have been involved in terror attacks against Jews in America. So, I, I, so I, I am, I, I just, I think the most important thing for us to do is to not allow anyone, I'm not, I'm not suggesting you're doing this, but there are those who would be only too happy to suggest that there is anti-Semitism on the left or there is anti-Semitism on the right, but certainly people in my party could never be anti-Semites. You hear that and you hear it on both sides and it's dangerous. <laughs> we have to be able to condemn anti-Semitism, whether it comes from a freshman member of Congress or whether, whether there's a failure to condemn uh, white supremacy or, or see very fine people marching in Charlottesville if those words come from the president of the United States. I just think we need to we need to to, to treat all language seriously. And uh, and I and frankly, the words of of a freshman uh, a freshman member whose views are outside of the mainstream. Um, I suggest if we're considering those, we absolutely need to consider the words of the president. I agree. I totally agree. But there's nothing we can do about him yet but um but it, it, you know i i feel like in I, some respect and i want to argue the point at that moment somebody should stand up and say wait a minute you can't say that that is what you know wendy yeah if i could if i'd step one second i think wendy lipstick from our office is on um and if yeah. i were on my computer and not just my phone i would go into the chat and i would post the speech that I gave at that moment, which I think is exactly what you you wish that someone had done. I don't want to. I'm not saying this to take credit. I'm saying this, like you you wanted someone to do this. I want to make sure that you can see I'll post what it. 
Yeah. What I said. Yeah. What I said. Post it to me, please. Perfect. Make me feel better. We'll do. Tr. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Representative George. Hi. Thank you so much for your time. So Hi. my my question it, it's somewhat related to anti-Semitism. Uh, so let me let me uh, clarify. It does have part of it. Uh, the we have a um, a candidate for Supreme Court of the United States. And never in my life, I could be wrong, have I seen a television advertisement. Okay. You hear me? Now I can, yes. Sorry. Uh, never in my life have I seen an advertisement on TV promoting a, uh, uh, a justice for the Supreme Court. Uh, so I happen to say this is really interesting, and I happen to look at the end to see and I saw it was an organization, America First Policies, that was the organization that paid for and did the ad. Now, I didn't know anything about this organization. I looked a little bit about it, but I see it's promoting the agenda of the president and a lot of other things on there. So how are we not to connect? And this is, to me, isn't even a dog whistle. This is like a, a foghorn or something. You know what? I'm sorry, how are we not to connect what? Um, to see that when she says, I am my own person and I will make my own decisions when aligned in the organization that's paying for an ad that she willingly, I guess, you know, uh, did an ad in there with it, that these are their policies. Uh, well, I don't, uh, I'm not familiar with the ad. Um, and I... I, but and I, I don't know whether she was familiar or not. I mean, from my perspective, the the issue with the Supreme Court nominee, uh, I, I have two issues with with this, as you brought, as you just referred to it. The first, um, a, as someone who's worked for more than a decade now to try to diminish the influence of money in politics, having outside groups spending millions of dollars, in this case. Uh, in connection with a Supreme Court uh, confirmation hearing, um, it just it, it doesn't advance anything. It 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 takes away from the process. Um, I think we ought to be able to to get big money out of politics. That's one thing. But the the bigger issue on on the nomination is uh, is less about who's advertising to support uh, the the uh, potential justice, as it is about the fact that. Uh, we're literally in the middle of an election, not not close to an election, but but tens of millions of people in America have already cast their votes. And here we are moving forward with a Supreme Court nomination uh, when uh, days after they have the vote, we may uh, learn that the American people have decided they think a different person should be making the nomination if uh, Joe Biden is elected. And in fact, there might be a different composition of the Senate. So I, I, I as I said, I don't love all of the money being poured into politics, uh, but the, the bigger issue for me is how Senator McConnell, Senator Rubio, Senator Scott, who, uh, who were so clear that the American people should have a say in who gets a lifetime appointment to the Supreme Court, um, how it is that in this case, because I guess just because it's President Trump, they've completely changed their view. And even though we're in the middle of an election, um, they can't wait until we see the outcome of that election before proceeding to fill the seat. That's the, the frustration for me. Okay, so we only have time for one last question. So Andy, do you want to ask your question? Thank you, Iwana. Thank you, Congressman Deutsch, for being here and, and taking the time with us. The question, just to stay focused on the issue why we're here, anti-Semitism, and you mentioned the treaty. How do you think the impact of the gas fields that we heard so much about that Israel's developing, as well as water technology, are economic drivers for peace as opposed to the political process? Uh, uh, they're, they're, very, that's, they're very significant, and that's a really, really important point. And, and it's uh, and I, I've spoken, I've spoken to the Emiratis about this. I've spoken to Bar the Bahrainis about this. I've spoken to other Arab countries that I think ought to be, uh, ought to be um, announcing normalization deals as well. Uh, they, these countries, the UAE, United Arab Emirates, uh, has 
has been very clear about trying to diversify their economy. And, um, and so when it comes to technology and water and agriculture and uh, so many other areas where Israel excels, there's a lot that they should be able to do together. And then at, at the same time, uh, when you look at their expertise and you realize that, uh, that in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, there, there have been these major fines um, of gas, which Israel and Greece and Cyprus uh, all recognize as, uh, as potential boons for them. It, it's a two-way street. And so you can, they can capitalize as, they, as we go forward with transitioning um, from oil to gas toward uh, renewables, and at the same time, continue to share technology on the new kinds of energy that the Arab countries are looking to, to move into. So I, I think there is, there is so much that, uh, that they, can, they can do and build upon based on, on the shared expertise. And who everyone, we're, we're all so proud of what Israel has accomplished. Um, what, what country uh, doesn't look at sort of the economic miracle that Israel represents and especially countries like the UAE, which are small, Bahrain, which is small, but which have their own success stories. Um, how is it they don't look at Israel and recognize the ability to become even greater by working together? And I think that's what you're seeing play out um, in, in real time. Thank you. Thank you so sure. much, Congressman. We uh, really thanks, appreciate everyone. you coming and speaking with us. I know this is a very busy time for you. Uh, it's my pleasure. Sorry about the, the technical difficulties, but thanks for bearing with me. And uh, don't hesitate to reach out to me and to our office if, if we can be helpful in any way. And I know I don't have to tell this group, uh, but I say this in the, the most nonpartisan way. Um, please make sure that everyone has a plan to vote if you haven't already. Early voting starts tomorrow and election day is on November 3rd. And um, and then we'll all go forward together. And I'm so grateful for the opportunity. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Now Judy's gonna introduce Eric Ross. Eric Ross joined the Anti-Defamation League or ADL in 2015 and now holds the title of Senior Associate Regional Director. Prior to joining the ADL, Eric held numerous positions in the organized Jewish community, including spending over five years working in the Florida regional office of APAC, first as the North and Central Florida area director, and then as the Broward County area director. In his current capacity, Eric coordinates ADL's Florida Hate Crime Coalition, responds to discrimination complaints that come through ADL's Florida office, and expands support for ADL's mission and initiatives through strategic community outreach efforts and working with volunteers. Eric has received certification as an ADL Words to Action, No Place for Hate, and Managing Implicit Bias for Law Enforcement Facilitator. Eric, his wife and two daughters live in Coral Springs and has most recently joined the city of Coral Springs Multicultural Advisory Committee and has assumed the role of committee chair. On behalf of the congregants and listeners from Temple Beth Am, we want to welcome Eric Ross. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, bear with me a moment while I share my screen. Of course, everything's in a different place now that I, I moved things around. Um, here we go. Okay, how does that look to everybody? Good. Good, great. Um, let me just move you all over here. Uh, okay, fantastic. So thank you again for having me here today. Thank you to everyone at Temple Beth Am, and thank you to Representative Deutsch uh, for his very informative remarks. Um, I hope that all of you are holding up well during these trying times and that your families are staying happy, healthy, and safe. So. When you heard the words Anti-Defamation League, I bet that almost every single one of you immediately thought of one thing and one thing only, anti-Semitism. Because yes, anti-Semitism is naturally the bulk of our focus at ADL, but it's not the only thing that we're concerned with. You see, for over 100 years, ADL's mission has been twofold, 
It's been to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and to secure justice and fair treatment alike. You see, the founders of ADL in 1913, they still fully understood what we, they fully understood what we still understand today, which is that that mission statement, it can't be accomplished without both parts. Yes, ADL was created to keep the Jewish community safe and secure, but the way we believe and have always believed we can do that most effectively is by ensuring that all communities at risk, all minority communities, all discriminated communities, and all people of all religious faiths are also as safe and secure as possible too. So today through our 25 regional offices and one in Israel, ADL is the world's leading organization fighting anti-Semitism and other forms of hatred through programs and services that counteract prejudice and bigotry. And that's one of the things that makes my organization so special. We have a narrowly focused mission, but a gigantic toolbox from which to address it. Very few people fully understand all of the different ways that ADL works to create a world without hate. So I'm gonna take a little time to explain ADL's work at the macro level before moving on to anti-Semitism today. And then we'll finish with what you can do to help counter the rising tide of anti-Semitism that we're experiencing. And then if you still have enough energy at the end, I believe we'll have a little time for Q&A. Uh, so how exactly does ADL do what we do? We start by what we call the ADL pie. And by that, I mean, we protect, we investigate, and we educate. ADL works tirelessly to protect and safeguard civil rights in our country by advocating for church state separation, fighting for social justice, protecting religious freedoms, and one of the activities we're most proud of, pioneering hate crime laws. It took us over 13 years as the anchor organization, bringing everyone together to lobby to bring about the Federal Hate Crime Protection Act in 2009. ADL also monitors, researches, and responds to individual reports of anti-Semitism and other forms of bigotry and discrimination. When someone is the victim of a biased motivated assault or their home is vandalized, like the one you see here from Orlando, ADL is here to assist the victim in any way we can. We'll act as a liaison between the victim and the police. We'll act as a liaison between the victim and the media if necessary. And sometimes we've even been known to uh, offer, offer up a reward um, for information that can help lead to an arrest. The next piece of the ADL pie is investigation. We investigate like no other organization you've ever known. Unlike law enforcement, we can keep and collect the information that we gather on extremists and hate groups for as long as we'd like. We have an entire team of investigative researchers and analysts in our Center on Extremism who are responsible for collecting data on these people, for monitoring the chat rooms and the websites that they frequent. And whenever possible, we, whenever they uncover actionable intelligence, they immediately give it over to law enforcement simply because it's the right thing to do. When an extremist commits a crime in America today, ADL is usually already aware of that person in some way, or at a bare minimum, we're already very much aware of their particular network of eight. For example, in late 2008, two white supremacists were arrested for plotting to assassinate then presidential candidate Obama. ADL already had huge files composed on, compiled on both of these men because our experts had already been in chat rooms with them for years collecting personally identifiable information that they'd been leaving. So when the ATF reached out for our assistance, we were able to immediately confirm their white supremacist ideologies and to connect their online personas with their real life identities, which aided in the arrest and conviction of Paul Schlesselman and Daniel Cowart. Lovely individuals, I'm sure. The last piece of the ADL pie is education. We educate the Jewish community, we educate other minority communities, we educate law enforcement agencies, we educate teachers and students, we educate anyone who can help us make a difference. Through ADL's The World of Difference Institute, which includes our No Place for Hate anti-bullying campaigns, we have conducted anti-bias training for over 400,000 teachers and well over a million students, spanning 16 countries and over 350 different colleges. Through our Holocaust programs, we are teaching educators, both Jewish and non-Jewish alike, how to better teach about the Holocaust. Through our Words to Action initiative, we are doing highly successful work with students on high school and college campuses, training them how to recognize anti-Semitism and how to determine the most effective response to what they've just witnessed. I wanted to tell you briefly about a great educational tool that ADL originally created to help law enforcement tackle anti-Semitism and bigotry but it's also something that you, the public, can benefit from as well. 
Our hate on display database can be found on our website by downloading the app or in pamphlet form. Without specialized training, we can't expect the average police officer to know what every single sticker on the back of a car means or what somebody's unusual tattoo might signify. But if an officer does pull someone over and they see something that doesn't sit right with them, they can open up the app on their way back to their cruiser to run the plates and find out what the meaning of tattoos like this might be. Now, in a lot of these photos, you'll see the numbers repeating 14 and 88 over and over and over and over again. It doesn't stand for the year 1488. It's two separate codes. 88 is the easy one. HH is what it stands for. H is the eighth letter of the alphabet. HH stands for Heil Hitler. 14 is a little bit more nuanced. It represents the number of words in what is commonly referred to as the white supremacist motto. We must secure the existence of our race and a future for white children. Now, we also do extensive educational trainings for members of law enforcement all around the country. Each and every year, ADL trains over 15,000 law enforcement officers in some capacity, which makes ADL the single largest non-governmental trainer of law enforcement in the country. We train them on hate crimes and hate symbols. We train them on extremism from the far left to the far right, from political extremism to religious extremism to sovereign citizens. And we train them absolutely free. They just have to ask. Now, shifting gears to anti-Semitism today, I'd like to explain a little bit about the work that ADL does to compile, to vet, and to quantify the numbers of anti-Semitic incidents occurring in America each year. Every year since 1979, ADL releases an audit of anti-Semitic incidents. We use it as a barometer to help us determine if things are moving in the right direction or the wrong direction, and to help identify areas that we may need to shift our focus towards. I'll be the first to admit that it's an imperfect science because it relies entirely on what people report directly to us, what law enforcement is willing to share with us, and what we can gather from the media and then independently verify. Like other self-reported issues like domestic violence, for example, we know empirically that there are a lot more incidents taking place out there than what we know about. But we do this year in and year out because it provides us with a good assessment of the trends taking place. Now, as you can see here on this slide from 2017 figures, the total number of incidents reported to us in 2017 raised nearly 60% from 2016, from 1,267 all the way up to 1,986. In fact, at that time in 2017, that was the second worst year on record since ADL began tallying those numbers 40 years earlier. Every part of the country was affected. For the first time in over a decade, we saw incidents reported in all 50 states in 2017. And unfortunately, things didn't get much better in 2018. There was a small 5% dip in total number of incidents, which is good, from 1986 down to 1879, but that was still the third highest total number of incidents we had ever recorded for a single year up to that point. I pulled some interesting tidbits for you here from the 2018 audit. Take a snapshot of your screen if you'd like. Um, I'll give you a moment to digest them while I take a sip of my drink. Um, but if you'd like to read the full report from 2018, uh, the website is listed in the bottom right corner of this slide. At home here in Florida, I actually have a little bit good news to share from that year, which honestly is not something I often get to do working at Anti-Defamation League. Um, in 2018, there were 76 verified incidents of anti-Semitism in Florida, representing a 22% decrease from 2017, when there were 98. Even better still, the numbers for 2017 were already a 28% decrease over the total number of incidents from 2016 here in Florida. Now, as appealing as it is to be optimistic about the Florida numbers, I can assure you that this trend did not hold true around the rest of the country. And to highlight that, I'd like to drill down just a little bit into 2017. Um, we noticed that there was a distinct difference between the number of incidents before the Unite the Right rally, which took place in Charlottesville in August 2017, compared to the number of incidents that took place afterwards, from September through December, less than half the year. And there was a 182% increase in incidents. And it's not just our findings that are showing this. The FBI, each year as they release their annual numbers of hate crimes for 2017, for 2018, 
the numbers just keep going up and up and up. They continue the same trends that our audits are showing. A few months back, maybe four or five months ago now, our 2019 audit numbers were released. And as you can imagine, these numbers included the horrific attacks at the Chabad of Poway, California on April 27th, the attack at a Jewish grocery store in Jersey City on December 10th, and the attack on the Hanukkah party at the home of a rabbi in Muncie, New York on December 28th. Sadly, 2019 showed us that we had increases across the board in basically every major category. Overall, we had a 12% increase in anti-Semitic incidents, all the way up to 2,107, which now set the new single highest record we've ever recorded on year for a single number of incidents in a single year since we started again in 1979 recording those things. We saw incidents of harassment, in vandalism, and in physical assaults with more than half of those assaults from the whole nation taking place in just the five boroughs of New York City. The only meaningful area that we saw a decrease in was in incidents that took place at Jewish institutions, such as synagogues, Jewish community centers, Jewish day schools, preschools, Jewish communal organizations that have brick and mortar institutions. There, thankfully, we did see a 12% decrease, which had followed a 23% decrease from the year before. I sincerely hope this is a trend that we'll see continue. And personally, I attribute that trend to the additional security hardening that our communal institutions have been undertaking over the last two to three years. I believe it's a direct correlation. For those of you who are more visual learners, this is a simple graphic showing the national increases over the past three years. So why is anti-Semitism on the rise? I know it's a loaded question. Lots of people have lots of different theories. I'm gonna share with you my top three reasons that I believe are the root cause of why we see this increase. First, anti-Semitism has been normalized. When elected officials claim that Jews use money to control Congress or blame the country's problems on globalists or publicly accuse Jews of invading their towns, this is the normalization of anti-Semitism. Collectively, we need a zero tolerance policy on intolerance. Second, it's social media. Look at Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, any of these services, we all use them, but with a click or a swipe, you can find horrifying anti-Semitism that would have made the Nazis proud. All because these companies' business model depend on those clicks and swipes, but it needs to end. Silicon Valley needs to step up and expel the anti-Semites and we need to disrupt the current clicks for profit model. About two months ago, ADL embarked on a national initiative called uh, uh, Stopping Hate for No More Hate for Profit. Or, no, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, it's escaping me at the moment. Um, but we've gotten thousands of, of, of opinion makers and, and, and people in the, the media and people in the public eye um, and companies, thousands of companies to get together and to temporarily do an ad pause on Facebook's platform to try and get them to do more that's well within their power to stop hate from the platform. Uh, that was in large part part of the reason why Holocaust denial was removed from that platform starting last week. Third reason that anti-Semitism was on the rise, in my opinion, is a lack of honesty. And Representative Deutsch started to address this. Anti-Semitism comes from all sides, but for far too long, people have been unwilling to admit it. We all must acknowledge anti-Semitism, even when it happens on our side. I'd say especially when it happens on our side. Yes, we have a problem with anti-Semitism from some elements on the far left and their casual demonization of the Jewish state definitely leads to the demonization of all Jewish people. And yes, we have a problem with anti-Semitism from some elements on the far right with the wild conspiracy theories and the white supremacists and white nationalists who promote them. And yes, we have a problem with anti-Semitism coming from some in minority communities. Now, it's not fair to ignore the evil of systemic racism or the social and economic challenges facing communities of color these days, and for hundreds of years for that matter, but there is no excuse for the bigotry of low expectations, and there is no world in which it should be socially acceptable to attack people because of how they dress or where they pray. We need a large number of people from all different communities to stand up and say enough. And just to be clear, yes, whether intentional or not, those who deny that anti-Zionism 
is rooted and based in anti-Semitism are also contributing to the problem. So let's take a look at a microcosm, a, 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 you know, a small example that shows how this all plays out. Let's look at college campuses today because in many respects, it is the easiest lens to view these things through. I'm guessing that many of you have children or grandchildren on campuses today, or perhaps they're going to be going off next fall. If you aren't already, you're probably starting to get nervous about the forms of hatred that they're going to witness and experience on campus. For the purposes of this cam campus-centric conversation, I'm gonna focus on right-wing-based anti-Semitism and left-wing-based anti-Semitism, the latter of which will mainly come disguised as anti-Israel activism. Contrary to what some might think, it's actually a lot easier to define what right-wing extremism on college campuses looks like because their efforts almost exclusively focus around recruitment and flyering. Midway through 2017, ADL released a report about an unprecedented uptick we witnessed in white supremacist recruiting on college campuses. During the 2016-17 school year, we found nearly 200 confirmed reports of flyers being distributed across roughly 100 college campuses around the country. From 2017 to 2018, we saw a whopping 182% increase in reported flyering incidents. And when you stretch across two years from 2017 to 2019, we saw white supremacy propaganda on campus increase more than six times. But sometimes our information surprises even the people who should be least surprised by the contents. When we published that report in 2017, we were quickly contacted by the Manatee Sheriff's Department because they had no record of a flyer that we reported as going up on the Bradenton campus of the State College of Florida. And they had checked with the campus security officials and they had no knowledge of it either. They took that a step further and told us we must be mistaken because they didn't believe that there was actually an active chapter of the Adam Waffen Division anywhere in Southwest Florida. So we must be wrong. Well, we were able to quickly and confidently respond by sharing these images with them. These were taken directly from the Twitter account of the Southwest Florida Adam Waffen Division. So clearly there was an active chapter that they were unaware of. But most interestingly, the photo on the left shows where we got our information from. That is the flyer taped to the campus map sitting on campus somewhere. It happened, we know it happened. We have visual evidence that it happened. In the end, campus officials conceded that perhaps someone took it down without reporting it, or maybe the people who posted it did it for the, uh, the shock factor, took the picture, and then they took it down themselves. Now, the second photo shows members of this group celebrating. Now, many of the members that you see in this photo were later connected to murders that took place in California, Maryland and Tampa. This is real. This is really happening in our backyard. Thankfully, that Twitter account no longer exists. Now, sometimes anti Semitism from the right does extend beyond flyering. So I'd like to talk briefly about Richard Spencer and his speech at the University of Florida on October 19th, 2017. Spencer is one of the leaders of the alt right movement. In fact, a lot of people don't realize it, but he's the person who coined the term alt-right. One of the significant obstacles that we're facing today is the awareness by those on both the extreme right and the extreme left that college campuses are both fertile grounds for recruitment and they also offer an endless supply of press to cover what takes place. It's no mistake that people like Spencer choose to speak at colleges and universities instead of public libraries or community centers. He is trying to get the most bang for his buck. But his recent visit to UF is also a great example of how ADL operates. In advance of his speech at UF, ADL worked with the university administration, with campus Jewish groups and minority institutions, and the larger Jewish community focusing on taking proactive security measures. Along with ADL Center on Extremism, we shared timely information with law enforcement regarding what was going to be taking place? Who was saying they were coming into town? What kind of information we had on these white supremacists that were planning to be in attendance? And we also had an ADL staff member on the ground to monitor the situation and to be a liaison to the community who wound up speaking at two different counter events that were taking place well away from Richard Spencer's speech. 
Now on the flip side of the coin is left-wing extremism on campus. Anti-Semitism from the left has nearly cornered the market on the mainstreaming of the anti-Israel movement in America today. That's right, we're talking about the BDS movement, the Boycott, Divestment, and Sanction movement. In 2016, ADL began a joint research project with the Ru Institute, an Israeli think tank, and the focus of the partnership is to create a comprehensive strategy for countering the BDS movement. The work is based on in-depth research and analysis of BDS efforts both in the US and globally, so that we can identify the many ways that the BDS movement has been effective and to ultimately outline the most effective ways to combat those effective efforts. We hope that our findings will ultimately complement and reinforce the excellent initiatives already being undertaken by ADL and other organizations. Students for Justice in Palestine, or SJP, is the primary organizer of BDS and other anti-Israel events on college campuses today. Being from South Florida, you may remember them as the group that posted eviction notices on uh, dorm room doors at Florida Atlantic University, going back about 10 years now. The group was first formed at UC Berkeley in 2001 and has now grown to over 200 chapters around the country in existence. Besides SJP, there's another group called Jewish Voice for Peace, which plays a very large role in anti-Israel campus activity. It is considered the largest and most influential Jewish anti-Zionist group in the US. Now, despite the neutral tone of their name, Jewish Voice for Peace sounds like a respectable group, JVP actively works to steer public support away from the Jewish state. They've assumed a very visible role in the BDS movement and have worked to support divestment resolutions on college campuses and in mainline churches all around the country. One of the newer trends that we're seeing, especially on college campuses, but elsewhere as well, is anti-Israel groups and organizations and individuals co-opting other social justice causes through emerging alliances with unlikely partners. Here you can see how anti-Israel groups have been making a concerted effort to couch their hostility towards Israel in social justice terms, like by linking the Israeli-Palestinian conflict to the events in Ferguson, or by linking Israeli security fences to border fences being erected on the Mexican border. This is all being done in an attempt to appeal to a broader base of support and to change the conversation so what does ADL do to help with responses to situations like these on college campuses? We train administrators, professors, and students about anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. We call for public condemnations of extreme activity. We advocate on the federal, state, and local levels. We share information with Jewish student groups and Hillel's across the country. We arm students with research and talking points to assist them. And most importantly, through our Words to Action program, we encourage students to counter bad speech with good speech. Now, there are two other very new forms of hatred that we've been dealing with that I'd like to talk with you about, and both are derived from the onset of the coronavirus. First, as the pandemic continues to spread, we had seen a sharp increase in activity by those looking for a scapegoat. There have been numerous cases of xenophobia and bigotry related to this virus, particularly against Asian and Asian American individuals and groups. Bullying, harassment, and slurs have become all too commonplace. Here in Florida, I haven't seen any reports of any actual hate crimes committed related to pandemic, but things had already gotten so bad that already by March 13th, University of Florida President Fuchs had to make this statement denouncing racist and bigoted comments taking place on his campus. And on March 25th, the Palm Beach Post reported about this young woman who was born and raised in America, being harassed publicly and verbally assaulted in Palm Beach Gardens simply because of her Asian heritage. Internationally, there have been many attempts to link COVID-19 to Israel, to Zionists, and to Jews, with some people baselessly claiming that the virus is part of a conspiracy of profit and gain by Israel and the global Jewish community, either that Israel created the virus to kill others or that the virus was created in order for Jews to, to benefit from creating a vaccine. And for a while, this charge was being led by an old familiar name, one that many of you are probably very familiar with, Dr. David Duke. Yes, that Dr. David Duke. 
the neo-Nazi, the former KKK Grand Wizard, the former Louisiana state representative, a former candidate for governor of Louisiana, and even a two-time former presidential candidate. Once as a Republican and once as a Democrat. I didn't know that last detail until I looked it up. The number of anti-Semitic conspiracy theories that he tried to spin over the first few months of the pandemic was shocking. These are just some of the examples from his Twitter timeline. And for a decade, he had been so careful at curating his timeline and including just enough hate to upset folks, but not enough hate to get kicked off of Twitter. Thankfully, I can report that because of his over-focusing on the pandemic and, and trying to blame Jews for it, he was finally kicked off of Twitter a couple of months ago. We've even seen credible reports of white supremacists plotting to use the coronavirus as a bioweapon to infect Jewish, Jewish and African-American communities. Now, the second new form of hate is, again, something that Representative Deutsch mentioned, and it is the concept of Zoom bombing. In the age of social distancing, I'm sure all of us have become very familiar with Zoom. We're using it right now. Zoom bombing is when someone infiltrates a video conference and then interrupts it with hate speech, with threats, with graphic images of hatred or hate symbols, and sometimes even nudity or outright pornography. Nearly every day, even seven months into this, we're still seeing these kinds of cyber attacks taking place. While some of these can be attributed to internet trolls who don't necessarily have specific racist intentions, there has been a sizable trend in extremists using it to specifically target Jewish institutions and other public forums with their anti-Semitic hatred. Across the country, we have seen online learning sessions disrupted, synagogue prayers defiled, funerals desecrated, and educational briefings just like this one interrupted. In fact, the University of Florida again, their student senate meeting was Zoom bombed with swastikas, genitalia, and sect acts last spring. And we've seen similar reports out of nearly every single university in the state of Florida. At one point, we even saw a kindergarten class in South Florida disrupted with calls to gas the Jews a kindergarten class. Now, for the question all of, on all of your minds, what can you do to help push back against that rising tide of anti-Semitism today? Let's start with the easy lifts. First, you can monitor activity in your community that affects the rights and treatment of all people. Remember, an attack on any religious minority is an attack on every religious minority. Second, don't engage in rumor mills. Be sure to confirm information you get before you pass it on as fact. When you receive that email telling you to boycott a particular company because they're racist or anti-Semitic, don't just assume that it's right. Go check it out. You have Snopes.com, TruthOrFiction.com right at your fingertips. It's very easy to check. Third, report any incidents to the ADL. If a hate crime has been committed, yes, of course, call law enforcement first. But then please visit ADL.org slash report incident and report it to us. We can't account for, for increased numbers if we don't know about those numbers. And if you have a problem that you need assistance with, we can't help you if you don't tell us about it. It only takes a few minutes to do, I promise. Fourth, report instances of bullying or religious harassment in schools to ADL as well. The lessons of our No Place for Hate programming are so valuable and we're willing to work with schools everywhere to counter bullying and cyberbullying in all its forms. And we have a team of professional educators ready to discreetly assist you when you find yourself in this situation. Even if you're worried about reprisals, we can help you wade those difficult waters. Fifth, you can visit ADL.org to sign up for information, news, and action alerts so that you can stay up to date on these issues. And sixth, you can get involved in our work and become a part of the solution in whatever way makes the most sense to you. Now, if, you're, if you want something more than an easy lift, I've got a little bit more for you to sink your teeth into. Many of you might be looking for resources that you can use at home, at school, at work, or recommend to your children or grandchildren. We have a wealth of items available to you on our website but I think my favorite one is called Words to Action. I'm sorry, it's called Think, Plan, Act. It's basically a, a substitute for our Words to Action program because Words to Action requires an ADL facilitator 
to come to you either in person or virtually. Think Plan Act has a ready-made toolkit filled with activities, with role-playing scenarios, and with practical lessons on how to recognize and counter anti-Semitism on high school and college campuses. If you'd really like to take a deep dive into the world of hatred, ADL's heat map is a first of its kind interactive and customizable map detailing extremist and anti-Semitic incidents around the nation. And we've backfilled it with data going all the way back to 2002. It can be filtered by type of incident, by type of ideology, even by state down to the zip code level. And if you'd like to focus exclusively on anti-Semitic incidents, we have a tracker for that as well, which can be filtered down to the state level. And finally, you can also continue your education beyond today's presentation by signing up to participate in ADL's ongoing Fighting Hate From Home webinars, which we began back in March, go figure, um, and has been hugely popular. One of the most popular webinars put on uh, you know, every time we do uh, around the whole internet. Um, so thank you once again for having me here today. I know it's a lot to digest. I try to share as much uh, interesting information that you probably didn't know beforehand. Uh, and where I can, I, I sprinkle in some good news when possible. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and um, to, and we can open it up to Q&A if, uh, if anyone has any questions. Andy. Eric, thank you very much for your informative presentation. Hopefully you'll be able to send your slide deck to Lana and she'll be able to share it with us. The one question that I have for you is this. Uh, obviously, there, or not obviously, but in the state of Florida, there is a statute that requires Holocaust teaching. What role does the ADL have in Florida in helping teachers be able to deliver curriculum as prescribed by the state statute? So it's a very good question. And it's, a, it's a, an often misunderstood statute. Um, ADL, I'm sorry, Florida does have a statute that says, uh, it's required to be taught at all levels of, of public school. Uh, what it does not specify is how it should be taught. There's recommendations that can be put out and things like that, um, but it's in many cases left to the individual school districts or even school by school on a case by case basis, how they implement it. Um, so uh, how is, does ADL impact that? The, the Nash, I'm sorry, the state level committee that does uh, offer um, its guidance and support in, in uh, it was created to, uh, as a, as a uh, sort of a, as a party to that um, statute. Um, our deputy director, Yael Hirschfield, sits on that statewide committee, so we always have a voice in whatever's taking place and whatever's going on. Um, now, uh, you didn't come right out and ask it, but I'm sure this question was in part motivated by the news over the last week or so about Palm Beach County School Board um, deciding to rehire uh, former principal uh, William Latson. Uh, so I'll just go ahead and, and answer that question before it comes up. Um, when that all went down, you know, in, in ADL's world, uh, credibility is the coin of the realm. We never rush to be first at anything. We rush to be right, even if that means we're the second, third, or fourth organization putting out a statement on something. We don't ever want to be forced to put out a follow-up statement saying, sorry, we got it wrong, unless that's because new information has come to light. So we operate in a slightly different world than, than some other groups that are always rushing to be the first to, to post something online or to send out a press release. Um, when all of this was going down last, uh, last school year, um, we were very vocal. And initially, um, we had, you know, ADL is not typically in the business of demanding people be fired. Um, we're always more in favor of educating folks and getting them to see the light and hopefully becoming an advocate for what they were once a proponent of an advocate against. Um, so in, initially we said that, you know, this was atrocious, this was unacceptable, that for those who aren't aware, a principal would respond to a parent saying that um, they don't believe it's within their purview to say that the Holocaust was indeed a fact because some parents and students uh, might believe that it isn't. So it's not, you know, it's not his role as a, as a school board representative to say whether or not the Holocaust actually took place. Um, so, you know, we said it was awful. We said it was inexcusable. We said that he needed to be reassigned immediately away from working with students. Um, but the straw that broke the camel's back for us was once he was reassigned, he put out a statement blaming the parent who had issue with his statement for, and 
flat out said that she lied about his statements to get him in trouble. And so, you know, he, he had already put out a, an apology, which we were happy to see, um, but no apology can truly be taken as heartfelt when they're later going to put the caveat, <laughs> this only happened because someone else lied and I didn't really say what I actually said as an imprint. Um, so we changed our, our stance to say that in light of that, it, he shows no contrition and, and will probably never, so we believe he should be fired. Uh, Palm Beach County School Board did fire him. Now, what you're not necessarily getting through the news now is that he took it to court. And a court of law determined that the act of his being fired was unlawful because by law, they were supposed to give him an, an issue a warning prior to firing. These are legal technicalities. These are contractual obligations. These are not the kind of things that your personal opinion really has much of a say over in a world as litigious as the one we live in. Um, so we were not surprised two weeks ago when the Palm Beach County um, Board of Education decided to rehire him because a court told them they had to. Uh, in the news late this week, they announced that despite what the court said, they're actually reconsidering that decision and this week they'll be discussing it. Um, ADL's official stance is that nothing in our view has changed. Uh, we stand by our previous statement. Uh, so I, I, I hope that answers your question as well as the, the, un, the un, unasked question as well. Um, Thank you very much. Looking at hands. I don't see any more. Oh, Jane, go ahead. Okay, this is a hard question for me to ask, and I'm not sure if you can answer it or not, but I am very alarmed, as we all probably are, and the rise in uh, all of these anti-Semitic incidents worldwide, but in particularly in the United States. We have an election coming up, and I don't want to go off on that tangent, but um, quite frankly, depending on what happens with the election, and uh, it's hard to predict the future in terms of what that effect would have, but the outcome certainly, in my opinion, might affect the trajectory of the rise, you know, in anti-Semitism. And um, when we learn about the Holocaust and history, we learn about our fellow Jews who felt they were secure. It could never happen here, it could never happen here. And uh, knowing all that you know about these incidents, you know, it's very important, of course, that we support Israel, but when do we actually I don't know how to say this. Um, our our, our mm -hmm. ancestors were too, you know, too felt too secure, and they said it's not going to happen. When do we take this even more seriously and do something where we might have to change where we live? So I, yes, I, I, I do get this question from time to time. Um, when, when is the time to uh, go to Plan B? Um, when is the time to use that? fallback option that we all have to, to be able to, to immigrate to Israel, to use the right of return as that they have for, for Jews. Um, there's no easy, it is a very difficult question as you pointed out, there's no easy, easy way to answer that. Um, you know, it, the number of incidents taking place have been on the rise. They've been high before, never this high as 2019, I said, was the highest ever, um, but they've been high before. They've been high any time that there's economic turmoil. The natural instinct is for people all over to blame the Jews. So, it, you know, it, it, this is nothing new. This, this happened with every major depression. This happens with economic turmoil. This happens at times of war. Um, I, I hope and pray that, you know, as life comes back to normal, that, you know, with the pandemic and, and hopefully uh, whether it's, you know, in November or, or you know, sooner rather than later when politicians stop inflaming, you know, hatred among, among, among people out there that things will start to subside. Um, but when you look at the numbers, you have to realize that we live in a significantly more connected world today than ever before. Something happens at a school two towns over from your granddaughter in Des Moines. 20 years ago, you never would have heard about that incident. Nowadays, you know by 4 p.m. 
because it was on Facebook. Somebody saw it. The, she told her mom. The mom, you know, the, you FaceTime once a week with with your kids. It, it's the interconnectedness is incredible. So in many ways, yes, there are definitely more incidents, but we're hearing about them so much more than we ever did before, and we're seeing the photographic evidence of them so much more than we ever did before. So I think in many people, there's this sense of anxiety and fear that's a little overinflated. I'm not saying you shouldn't be worried, but I'm saying you may not, you know, if you were to unplug from social media for a couple of months, you, I think those fears would, would alleviate just a little bit, not you in particular, the royal you, all of us. I could stand to, to unplug from social media as well. Um, I, I don't think we're at that point. And, and even the numbers, you know, me personally, I would draw the line when violent anti-Semitism becomes the norm as opposed to the exception to the, to the types of anti-Semitism that's taking place. Um, I hope that answers your question, Jane. Thank you. Nina? Unmute yourself. I know that, well, up until the virus, there was a program that ADL did in some of the schools, No Place for Hate. Yep. Is that all done by volunteers? Uh, no, actually, it's not done by any. Well, so for the Florida region, we have an education committee, and their job as volunteers is to get us into more schools to help us make connections. Uh, but the actual uh, educating of students um, is done by ADL hired, ADL trained facilitators. Uh, around the country, we're in thousands of schools, and we have literally hundreds of facilitators that we have hired. We have trained to do things the ADL way, and each school gets their own tailored um, curriculum for that. And it's not just a one-off. A lot of anti-bullying groups will bring in a basketball star, a rally, they'll say bullying isn't cool, and then they go home and that's it. And there's no follow through. Ours is a school year long program where there's benchmarks to meet and programs, school-wide programs that have to occur. Um, but our facilitators are specifically to go through an extensive um, 40 hours of, of advanced training to become an ADL facilitator. Uh, but then at that point, we pay them uh, like adjunct teachers to go into these schools uh, and do those trainings. And they will still be taking place virtually this year uh, as best as possible. But um, some schools are, are opting not to necessarily do it uh, because they're doing school virtually and it's, it's tough enough to get in all the teaching they have to get in. in, a, in a, do in you a do it for schools that request it or do you go to the schools and say, we'd like to help you to do a program like this? So it works all different ways. Uh, sometimes, you know, the request comes in in a variety of forms. Sometimes an administrator is savvy or they worked at a different school that was part of our program and they know about it and they see a problem and it's reactionary. Or there's a bad problem and a parent turns to the administrators and says, you need to bring in ADL. Uh, or there's backlash in the community because something bad is going on and it's coming to light. Um, other times it's proactive. Or just, you know, if somebody hears about it, they, uh, you know, oftentimes teachers or administrators will switch schools and they'll bring something from a school they used to be at. Um, the idea is it's not a magic silver bullet. You don't have a problem, bring us in for one year and wipe your hands, the problem solved. It's, it's, it's a way of thinking about things. It's a way of getting students, parents, teachers, and administrators to stop sticking their head in the sand, but to confront problems head on, to be proactive in their approach to things. The key is to be upstanders instead of bystanders. Because over time, not just one school year, but when you have that concerted effort over three, five, 10 years of the same school doing the program, and the students witness their teachers, their administrators, the, the, the janitorial staff, the football players, their, their friends standing up to hatred, either directly or indirectly by going and doing the right thing and telling us a teacher. When you see people doing the right thing, when you see teachers doing the right thing, administrators not pretending something isn't happening, but calling a rally to discuss it and confront it, over time those things categorically stop happening as often um, because it changes the, the atmosphere of the environment. So yeah, our No Place for A program is very special. Um, right. We're hoping to continue doing it as, in as many schools as possible. Thank you. Judy. I'm glad to hear that. Um, for the 20 something years that I taught in the classroom, early childhood, um, and, and they made such a big deal about bullying. And I always felt like tolerance should have been part of the curriculum, which it wasn't, and should have been tied into bullying. But my first lesson every year, no matter what age, whether I was teaching first, second grade, whatever, was on tolerance. 
And I think it's sorely missed. I'm so glad to hear that there is a program that you guys provide. Someone raise their hand. Mark. Hi, Eric, thanks so much for this uh, program. It's very informative. Um, what's your opinion on where we failed in educating the black community and particularly younger blacks or, or those with, uh, sorry, uh, African-Americans that have decided to take prominent anti-Semitic stances, you know, based on misinformation. I mean, we had Jews marching with them in the early days for civil rights and stuff. Somehow this doesn't seem to be communicated down the lines and instead we're the, the wealthy people um, either abusing them or taking away their, their true Jewish roots from them, that they're the true Jews. And, and, and I don't understand why this still is getting promulgated. Where are we missing the boat? So it's, it's a very topical question uh, in the day that we live in. Thank you for asking it. Um, I, I don't ever feel, you know, I'm the ADL guy, I, I don't ever feel it's, it's proper or fair to paint any group with one broad stroke of the brush. Um, and while there are definitely, you know, people in the public eye, uh, lately we had Deshaun Jackson, we had um, uh, Ice Cube and Ice T and, and, uh, and people in the public eye who, uh, who are basically mimicking the language of Reverend Louis Farrakhan. Um, and yes, we had leaders within the Black Lives Matter movement who are also expressing anti-Semitic views and statements. Um, but to say that we've we've missed the boat with the entirety of the black community, I don't believe is is quite accurate. Um, any more than you can say that any ethnic community outside of the black community hasn't also missed the boat on outreach with the black community or the Hispanic community or the Asian community. And we we like to talk about how we live in this melting pot of of America. Um, and perhaps here in South Florida, it's a little more so than it is in other parts of the country. But generally speaking, when you step out your front door, generally speaking, when you go to school, generally speaking, when you go to pray at your house of worship, whatever it might be, if you're in America, almost everyone else around you is going to look just like you. Um, so, you know, while it's, it's certainly a shame and it's certainly, uh, you know, a missed opportunity, as you put it, that more connections haven't been kept up since the days of the civil rights movement when prominent Jewish leaders, including the president of ADL, was walking across the, the Pettus Bridge with Dr. Martin Luther King. And there was an ADL president standing in the Rose Garden for the signing of the Civil Rights Act because the Civil Rights Act was written in part in an ADL office. Same thing with the Voting Rights Act. Um, but I would say that, that this has been very common across pretty much all communities. Um, now, I'm, I'm heartened over the last 20 years, you've seen JCRCs, you've seen uh, religious uh, uh, communities within synagogues doing lots of extended outreach to try and reach out to the African community, African American communities, to Latino communities, to the LGBTQ community. Um, we're seeing this more and more and more. And so I have hope for the future. Um, when it comes to uh, the leaders, though, that you mentioned, um, again, I go back to that, you know, ADL always... Uh, would prefer not to use our bully pulpit first, um, because who's going to listen to ADL? Honestly, who's who's really going to listen to ADL when when their favorite basketball player or their favorite rock and roller or their favorite football player said something? They're, they don't care what we have to say. We always reach out quietly behind closed doors first to try and educate. Um, the, the, the best and, and clearest example of how this plays out was about two years ago. LeBron James is probably the most famous basketball player in the world. I think he has something like 10 million followers on his Instagram. And he did something, it's a concept called punching up, where you think you're paying a compliment to somebody, but in reality, you're reinforcing a stereotype. It could be a negative stereotype or even a positive stereotype, but you're still not doing a good thing, even if you think you are. And he posted something on his Instagram that wasn't even his own original thought. He was quoting rap lyrics that said, said something along the lines of, I always want Jews handling my money because they've got the banks on lockdown. And it doesn't matter if he thought he was saying that Jews are smart. It doesn't matter if he thought that he says, was saying that Jews are good accountants or good bankers. The reality was that statement was playing off of age old anti-Semitic tropes about Jews being money hungry or greedy or controlling the banks or a global domination attempt through the, the, the financial industry. 
These are all bad things. So play it out. We got Florida office, opposite end of the country. He's in California. We got five calls that day demanding that ADL in Florida hold a press conference to call LeBron James an anti-Semite. So what would have happened? Play it out. Those five people would have been really happy and they would have felt good that we were out there publicly name calling somebody. And then 10 minutes later, they would have moved on to the next issue of the day. But would any of his 10 million Instagram followers have cared what ADL was screaming from the rooftop? No. Would any of his 10 million Instagram followers have read our counter post to his post? No, of course not. Would any of them have bothered one bit to change anything in their lives? And most importantly, would he have ever chose to engage with us after we were out in the public eye calling him names? No. So what did we do? We reached out privately behind closed doors. We educated him on what these things actually mean and what was the outcome. He deleted his initial post. He posted a brand new post apologizing, a heartfelt apology and explaining ways he was going to make good on that apology and then explaining to all of his followers why it was wrong, why it was problematic, what was the issue. And now all 10 million followers had the opportunity to learn and benefit from that ripple effect. So that's why we're always going to go that route first. And that's how it worked with Deshaun Jackson in Philadelphia a few months ago. Um, sometimes folks aren't willing to sit down with us though. So when somebody ignores us over and over again, or they show us their true colors over and over and over again, eventually we will use that bully pulpit. We will use the court of public opinion. And uh, when we need to use it, we have a pretty big bully pulpit here at ATL. Excellent answer, thanks. You're welcome. Any other questions? I'm just looking for hands. Okay, thank you so much, Eric. We really, really appreciate your coming on. Thank you. My pleasure. It's uh, always a pleasure, especially when it's, you know, it would have been in my backyard if I wasn't doing this virtually. I'm in Coral Springs. Both of my mother and mother-in-law live in Kings Point, Tamara, right down the road. Oh, oh. <laughs> well, Eric, we look forward to seeing you in person someday soon. Someday soon, God willing, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. And everyone join us on two.